motorcycle over the wrought iron thing, and apparently the the, the river Tiber can absorb ninety percent of a bomb blast. And hey, did you hear that the first cow lady made a new movie? Let's talk about that one. I I guess. Hey everybody, this is the Goat and a Fox talk about movies. I'm Daniel Goldhorn, and I'm Raynard. And today we're going to be talking about Kelly Reichardt's showing up. And so here's the thing. So I, so I, I said like, you know, like the first cow lady. And the thing is that for whatever reason, I had thought that first cow was like her first movie for whatever reason. It's the first one I saw from her. And then, um, when I was, I had seen showing up and I looked more into her and I was like, oh my God, she's. She's done a lot of stuff. This is her what, eighth movie, and she's been going since night. Yeah, she's been going since 1994. That was so. So I have to see more of her stuff now. Yeah, she's definitely a favorite of mine. I think she's kind of one of our greatest like working directors. I want to throw her in some hyperbole. Um, she's also got a really interesting working relationship with uh, Michelle Williams in, from this film, but she also worked in. Uh, what Meek's cut off? She's kind of like a pioneer movie. Um, Wendy and Lucy, I think one or two others. But you know, it's it's you know, and it's interesting to kind of look at this film and kind of unpack this, but also to kind of think about it in the context of sort of Reichardt's interests and how she works with uh, Michelle Williams and some of her other kind of like repertory players in that regard. Absolutely, and the. Uh, just seeing this, and again, this is only my second film of hers that I've seen so far, and already I can tell, like, I want to get back and see the rest of those films, because, you know, I'm starting to see, you know, some interesting patterns, things that I really love, things that I got a lot out of, and, you know, I wanted to kind of, you know, I think we, we both want to kind of cast a spotlight on this movie, because this came out very recently for me, locally, up in upstate New York. You saw this last year, right? Like in October? Yeah, I actually saw it at the New York Film Festival when it was screening there. I wanted to go to a film there, and it was kind of the one I got. And I was like, well, shoot, I guess I have to watch some more Reichard. <laughs> there we go. It's a, it a good choice. It's a good choice. I don't want to go to a film festival. Yeah, it's um, a good time, so you get to stand in line a lot. You're Wait. actually at... <laughs> Cause you're you're at SIF now, right? At Seattle. I just got out of it. Yeah. Just, oh my it God. is. My eyes are bleeding. <laughs> <laughs> I saw 29 movies. I yeah, have to die. I have to clockwork orange it by the end. Just like you yeah. gotta absorb them all into your brain. <laughs> um. Yeah. So let's talk about this one. So showing up uh, takes place in Portland, Oregon, and it follows uh, this woman named Lizzie, who is an artist trying to make ends meet and just kind of get through life. And that's the thing I've noticed, you know, I'm starting to pick up at the pattern on is that, you know, it's a very unassuming kind of movie. It's a very unassuming character. Um, it has a very natural feel to everything. Um, and one of the things that I noticed, so when the movie opens for the first, I want to say like 10 15 minutes we're just kind of following lizzie like through her life and it, it was kind of interesting because we have this you know we see these different conversations with different people and we don't necessarily have context to understand what they're talking about like they mention people that i don't think we even see like hey god do this god do that and at this moment, I kind of started to realize that exactly what was being said wasn't as important as the emotion it was eliciting, but how, you know, it, it kind of, how it was making us feel and painting this picture of how Lizzie feels like her life is kind of in a dead end, like kind of in a rut. Yeah, I think that the way that the, the movie is using dialogue is more to kind of create, like you're saying, like an atmosphere. It's very textural it's kind of a given it's more plot driven than some of her other stuff in kind of the general thrust but it, yeah what what they're talking about in a given moment whether it's oh are you going to go to this art show or you know talking about family it's yeah again more about kind of what 
is being created about like it's about the kind of space between those and about more the nature of these relationships and what do i get from that through this conversation or through these actions you know i think it was interesting i'm looking also over just kind of my notes from the new york screening and the initial poster <laughs> for this movie looks like it's a fucking horror movie or something <laughs> it's just like i'm sure you can find it somewhere but it's like a washed out like pale blue close-up of michelle williams face and she's like holding it looks like a phone and she's got this kind of mildly shocked expression on her face it's it sounds like <laughs> there's some sort of like psycho thriller Whereas I think the poster that's kind of now being used in distribution is much more appropriate for that in that sense of creating a tonal idea, but also more like it's going to allude to how I think another important thing that we're going to get into is how difficult creating the art is and how much work it is for her. It's not glamorous or effortless for uh, Lizzie's character. It's, it's a lot of needing things and, and and like needing us in dough or whatever and and working at it and stressing out over it and being not happy with herself essentially i think that's a really good point that you bring up because this is something that i noticed and when i was doing my research uh going into the deep forbidden troves of wikipedia there was a specific turn of phrase that i noticed where it was she refuses to romanticize her characters and their struggles. And that's something I kind of appreciated in the movie because you look at this, you contrast it to other movies about art and artists. You know, I'm looking at mm -hmm. Damien Chazelle, like his, his Babylons and his La La Lands, and he eulogizes this pain struggling artist. And here, that, that you know, the de glamorization of the art world here, I think makes the story much more impactful if it makes it feel ground grounded down to earth and connect with lizzie more um and you know just these little things like you know oh talking about grant applications you know having mm -hmm. to spend you know part of your time behind a desk in a computer doing business stuff just trying to get the you know trying to get a show put together um, there's one scene I really liked where you see like a nude model who had to like go take like a bathroom break and <laughs> just like wrap himself up, um, run down the hallway and then he comes running back and it's just like it's it makes a lot more of a human element appear in the story. Yeah, I love that the MPA gave it a, an R solely because of <laughs> brief graphic nudity. <laughs> I don't even think they're squaring in it, but Lord forbid we see peeing uh, for a second as a comedy <laughs> shot. Uh, but but uh. yeah, no, I, th I think there's like a uh, there's a there's a frankness to her depiction of this kind of very small, very specific world where it's for the artists. You know, again, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of like mind numbing applications and and you know getting your installation put together and stuff and i think you see kind of coming from that there's there's competitiveness you know the central relationship between joe and lizzie is you know there's senses of inadequacy or, or you know other people getting more success than you but then there's also support you know everyone going to all the uh exhibits when they do happen and going to all the showings and stuff so yeah i think that she's kind of it feels very immersive and lived in and even though she's not really like handing it to you there's not some giant expository dialogue which would be the most boring thing of all time <laughs> like just some marvel style like plot dump how to be insane but you do like come to understand these people and their drives and their fears and their uh you know happiness through all these little kind of elements yeah it's a great it, and I don't know, it's, just, it's a story where, you know, there's so many different facets to every person. Like you mentioned, um, Joe, who is, you know, uh, Lizzie's landlord, and Joe is also an artist, and she's a more successful artist. Like, you know, Lizzie's like, you know, is like, hey, you know, just so you know, I have to get ready for a show. I'm doing a show next week. And Joe says, oh, I know, you know, like, you know, I'm doing the same thing. I actually have two shows I'm preparing for. <laughs> <laughs> and, um... 
And it's interesting because, you know, there's... You know, even if it's not like a super outwardly competitive field, there's still that sense of like, oh, like, I still have to catch up. I still have mm -hmm. to... Yeah, and that's just the kind of the sense that you get for Lizzie's mindset at the beginning of this movie. Um, and then things take a turn when uh, a pigeon gets into Lizzie's apartment. Um, her her cat Ricky catches it and Liz like you know puts it back outside. And there's this funny line where she's just like puts outside like go 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 die somewhere else. Go die somewhere else. <laughs> um, and then Joe finds it in the morning. She's like, oh, this little bird, you know, got hurt. Um, yeah, and someone take care of it. Puts it in a box. Asks Liz to take care of it for a day. And at first, you know, Liz doesn't, she doesn't want to do it. She's like, she, I have to finish my art. I'm taking the day off work to focus on getting ready for my show. Over time, she kind of starts to care about the bird more. She's like, oh, it's not doing you know it's like is it is it sick it's panting you know like it's you now she's kind of paranoid and you know like you know the vet like you know that tries like oh it's it's fine you know let's get like a hot water bottle and Liz is still so you know uptight about like oh you know what but what if it's you know and the vet just kind of goes it, it's a pigeon it's like it's designed to survive <laughs> yeah um and it's so this this bird is is gonna become like a symbol. I'm gonna put on my my big boy thinking hat for this because we're gonna talk about symbolism. It's a symbol, and I'm gonna kind of you know this will be something that you know I kind of start here. I'll finish this thought later on by the end of the podcast. But uh, at first, you know, the bird is like this positive thing in her life. Like I noticed how things felt a little bit more. I don't know how to say it, but like, it felt like they had more direction. And that's not to say like the first, the you know, the opening part of this movie was like directionless in a bad way. It felt very intentionally like, you know, she she's just kind of going through the motions to a certain point. And then when like the bird hits and suddenly there's like a big focal point to the movie. And it almost feels like it's, it feels like it's like a grounding force in her life. But then she starts to kind of become possessive over it, eager to start taking care of it. And when she hands the bird back to Joe, she keeps insisting that it has to have its papers changed more regularly. Yeah, I think it's definitely kind of something that whenever a filmmaker is introducing something like that, that's so, especially in a story that has up to this point been so, you know, not directionless, but very just kind of soaking in a, a vibe or whatever. You're like, okay, well, what what's the intent of this? You kind of in the back of your head, like your singer, is it a symbol? What's the, what am I supposed to get out of it? And, you know, I kind of view it with regard to her family and kind of her state with that. So I guess we can kind of push this to the side for the moment. But there is a very cute pigeon with a little sling in a box during this entire time that she's dragging around Portland or, or more like kind of like the Hillsboro, like outer neighborhood area. But uh, it's just, it's just chilling, making its pigeon noises. So speaking of like, you know, Liz's family, um, we also, uh, we have three main uh, folks there. We have her father, her mother, and her brother. Now, now her father is a retired artist he did pottery, and now he's just kind of, he does chores, and he's like, once my chores are done, I get to watch TV again, and it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, also get taken advantage of by his weird, like, live-in friends or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and she's like, oh, your day sounds so dreadful, and, you know, you have these two people, they like, crashing on your couch, and she doesn't like it. Um, but he's like, oh, I don't mind them. I don't mind them. <laughs> You. Also, it's funny because like Judd, you know, Judd Hirsch, Michelle Williams together, we got a little yeah. tiny Fableman's reunion. This was my favorite <laughs> of the two. I yeah. think they were far better in this film than in Fableman's, but uh. that's my <laughs> spicy take. Oh no, Steven Spielberg's Coming gonna. Steven. 
Better be careful or he'll, he'll get David Lynch to back up. <laughs> Only if he shows up with an eye patch, then I'm fine. <laughs> Just makes uh, a threatening weather report to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sunny day in Seattle, except for you. <laughs> You're gonna get a lightning strike in your window. <laughs> I'm just happy you noticed me. <laughs> um. Yeah, and then you have uh, Liz's mother, and she like, she works for her mother. Mm -hmm. Um, and you kind of get the sense, like, oh, like, you know, there's this relationship where, like, you know, like, they can, they talk to each other, but they all are just, like, they seem to be more caught up in, like, in their work. Um, or her mom's like, like, listen, like, I'm trying to work right now. And, you know, if you're taking a day off tomorrow, you just take it. Um. Yeah, and then you also have the brother, brother. Yeah, the brother. Um, um, it uh, was not quite all there. Yeah, uh, he's gone through some crisis. Yeah, it's um, and like you know, and Liz's mother is like you know, you know, he's he's brilliant. You know, he makes stuff like you know, he's he's a little odd, but you know, I promise he's fine. And then Liz like goes to visit him, and he's like in his backyard, like having dug a hole. As deep as he is tall, he's like, I'm making a new piece. I'm going to make it. Like uh, complaining about like channels being taken off of his television. and Yeah, he's going through some stuff. Um, But yeah, like Lizzie's character very much kind of serves as the go between between uh, all of the rest of her family members. And she kind of has this role of this reluctant caregiver in a way not reluctant but kind of put upon to a certain extent which i kind of see reflected also in the the bird you know there are these these people in her lives or these relationships she has which she struggles with but then when if the option is to like set it aside or not to do something for somebody she can't find it in herself to you know turn away or uh you know defer to somebody else she has to kind of do that for them and for herself you know it's like she can't bring herself to not act i i i agree with that like when i did like my little notes here put like a little outline mm -hmm. i took like all all the different parts of the movie and i organized them in a list i was like okay gotta find the the meaning of the movie and put it all together. Um, and that was something that I kind of um, grabbed onto as well. This connection between caring for the bird, caring for a brother, um, things that like you know, caring for her dad. Like you know, it's like oh, trying to like protect him from these people that she thinks are taking advantage of him, which kind of looks like they are, honestly. Um, and then. And then we also have the the water heater bit, so the the water heater <laughs> saga, if you will. Yeah, oh lordy. Which I think this is a good point, to, like kind of a good crux for this, kind of along with the pigeon. This is a key kind of conflict point. Yeah, because um, the water heater for the building is not working, and. Uh, Liz is like, she doesn't, you know, she has to go take showers at other buildings because the water heater for her is, is, it's been broken and Joe has kind of been putting off getting the water heater fixed and Liz doesn't like that. And it escalates to the point where like Liz sends an angry voicemail about it to Joe, which you can see in the trailer. <laughs> to a person i'm sick of it have a great night it's very oregon <laughs> i think and that's really important to like emphasize is um you know like the way we've been describing liz at this point we've been focusing on you know we're obviously getting to joe but it's really important to emphasize that she's not some kind of saint or put upon uh 
you know, kind of individual who's completely perfect and that is kind of the vessel for misery in this. You know, she's also kind of an annoying person. Like, she's very needling and neurotic and whatnot. So there's this, you know, and then Joe, you know, is not kind of by contrast this, you know, villainous landlord person all in all. Like, there's tensions and stuff between these two women, but they're also complete individuals who are not, like, a singular kind of... uh you know, entity. They're not a symbol of this is the good one, this is the bad one, and this is the duality of art or something. I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, there's there's interesting kind of layers to these people. Absolutely. And, you know, because there's that scene where Liz confronts Joe in person and Joe says, you know, I'm getting a new heater. It's coming. It'll be a couple days, but it's coming. And she's also, you know, by the way, I don't appreciate you sending me like that mean voice message she remarks that she has you know that you know like you know you have a good deal here like you know you're not charging you a lot of rent and it was interesting because like uh, silas so i was saying like oh is she going to transition to be more of like an antagonist but like you said mm -hmm. this isn't that kind of movie you know where it's because later on like joe shows up for liz's show and it seems like you know they're, they're on good terms again you know and it's because, you know, in life, you have these altercations between people. You have, you know, you, you can have a fight with someone and still have a good relationship with them. It, yeah. And, oh, go ahead. And I think, I think you do have, you know, you again, like, there's there can be different, like, facets to your relationship with someone. And, you know, we see that there is mutual support here, but then there's also room for Liz to kind of feel this... Um, inadequacy in a sense you know she's uh, Joe has a leg up on her in terms of financial situation because she has the property so she does she's more financially stable than Liz is she's also like you were saying she has more art showings and whatnot she's more successful and privileged in that regard and her art is much more exuberant than Liz is there's these big like yarn situations like that fill up an entire room versus Liz's kind of smaller worked over pottery and stuff so it's kind of there's just different aspects of being brought out in these people and that's something I really admire with this kind of storytelling this way of, pre of presenting more complete people for us to engage with explore and I just really admire art I admire films that do that, that tell these kinds of stories, that create these kinds of characters. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, jumping over to Liz's show, you know, as she's getting ready for it, she has to make these sculptures. And there's this one shot I really like where um, it's this extended take of her like sculpting, like trying to add like little arms to her statue and everything. And it's just, it's really cool to see this process come together. Kelly Reichardt really likes her long shots, and well, no, that's because a long shot is like a very specific way of like composing a frame. I'm talking about like a shot that lasts for a long time. A take. A, yes, a long take, like extended take. She's like sitting <laughs> with this like uh, telephoto lens, like at the opposite end of the large room, <laughs> shouting to her down the. <laughs> She's like tiny in the frame, working on. The <laughs> I mean, that'd be a way to improve it. So, I don't know. Be, be nice, okay? Like, I only want. I only. <laughs> I know it's semantics. <laughs> um, but anyways, um, yes, I I like that shot. And then, um, you know, there's like different things. Like she glazes it, and then has to go get fired, and. I, I just remember thinking, I was like, oh, I was on the edge of my seat, I was like, oh my god, one of these things, like, it's gonna break, and I can, uh, like, the little arm that she sculpted, it's gonna, like, break off or something, and then it'll be the end of the world, like, the planet would just mm -hmm. explode, <laughs> um, because this is that kind of movie. <laughs> um, and then I, it turned out I was, like, half right, because during the firing process, one of her pieces, one of the better ones, even, accidentally gets burned on one side 
And that also then becomes a symbol. We've got two symbols in this movie. We're we're really this I'm banging Great Gatsby. <laughs> I'm banging both my neurons together as hard as I can for this <laughs> one. Uh. Well, and there's that great shot like after she comes home without where kind of the camera's like starting at the like house party that Joe's having, and they kind of just like tilts over the patio to see uh, Liz show up with her fucked up pottery and <laughs> just kind of at the nadir of her her whole arc there. Yes, it's just it's uh just the way that this movie is shot is very it it creates like little moments of like like comedy or like joy or things like that that really help to brighten everything up. It's because it it could it would have been really easy for this movie just to be like this gray kind of and uh, mm -hmm. you know this like you know straightforward thing but there's just so these little moments like personality that are accomplished through very subtle ways um and also more explicit ways through the um you know through the dialogue through the characters that you're doing on the screen and mm -hmm. i just really appreciate how it just makes the movie feel like so feel brighter yeah it's 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 you appreciate the the kind of higher highs because of all these sort of there's multiple levels of emotion going on at once and that kind of helps you to sort of feel situated in it rather than you're just observing this sort of morose tale of artistic suffering or something like yeah. that right exactly so then we have the big show liz's big show um and again another shot i really loved in here where before everyone arrives there's this and i think this one is actually a long shot um where uh we see liz like coming in and she's at the far end of the gallery and just see like this massive white wall and it really gives this idea of like like this empty space this empty mm -hmm. space that is about to be filled with her work with people who are here to support her and i just and really with cheese <laughs> very important that's the most important part of this movie gotta get uh, those craft singles in there <laughs> Oh no. At least get like the Sargento slices. Like those are <laughs> it's a little high budget for <laughs> our showing. Um but it's just like again those those things that evoke emotion are very powerful. Um and so like everybody starts arriving. Um her dad arrives along with his friends, he's looking at all the pieces. And he says, you know, he, you know, he looks like the burn piece and she's like, oh, you know, it's, you know, looks nice. And, you know, he's, he's, and, and I like the, you know, he's going through and he's like, he, you can tell he's like very, very much appreciating all the, the work that Liz has done. Mm hmm. Um, and like a coworker friend brings along a gallery director who might be interested in showing Liz's pieces. Um, and get the sense like, oh, like, you know, this could be. You know, a stepping stone to something really big. Uh, Joe arrives and brings the pigeon. So, you know, this is a good scene. Uh, the pigeon's here. <laughs> Just makes everything better. Um, but then her mother gets delayed because her mother went to pick up her brother. And her brother is like, is, is gone. It's like, oh, like, where is he? Is he all kind of like, is he okay? And we see, like, the mother, like, looks around trying to find him but when she can't like she she comes to the gallery because you know she you know she, it, it's because you know, she because she wants to still be supported and everything but um it was like oh my god like you know you can't find him what he must be out there like what, what is he doing and then he just walks in the door and makes a beeline for the cheese <laughs> the man knows what he wants yeah. and because like we get to like this climactic moment where like the family is all um you know you have you know liz's parents are divorced you can tell that it wasn't necessarily it wasn't a um 
an amicable one. <laughs> <laughs> but as it's going on, like, you know, it's kind of like things are kind of blowing. And then these kids in the background, like, they find the pigeon, like, oh, pigeon. And they start to, like, unwrap its sling. And the pigeon then starts flying around the gallery. Just utter and... chaos. <laughs> And I think what was interesting is that, um, like, it's kind of like flying around, it, get, it settles down on the floor, and then it's her brother, who is the one who's able to approach it, and I pick it up, and he carries outside, and he sets it free. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, like, it's the combination of, like, these symbols, you know, like, in a, these characters coming together, um, and that first of all, I think... It really solidifies the connection that we have between her family, the relationships with the people around her, and the, the bird box. Yeah, kind of unifying these two ideas into one sort of visual space. Right. And then, you know, the idea that, you know, the pigeon was like, it was ready to go. It was, it was ready to go, um, but they didn't know about it yet, because they were just like, they still had it all wrapped up to be like, nice, snug, and safe. And for me, it kind of culminates in this idea of... The theme of this movie, for me, what I took away from it was... This message of kind of learning to let go of things in life, where it's like, you can't micromanage your way to success, can't micromanage your way to getting what you want at a certain point you have to learn to let things go to let people you know to kind of let people do what they what they're doing you know because like even if you're like oh that doesn't make any sense you know you're not you know why do you have these people in your life um you know sometimes people have are going for things that you might not understand yeah, or like at least that's kind of a facet of life. I think that you kind of get not conflicting, but kind of um, paralleling ideas in in this. There's these kind of ephemeral elements of life that are just they're going to happen, and we can't kind of control them or, or how necessarily how they ultimately end up. But then there's also I think. Uh, the you know the evidence of this like her work was the like the exhibit of the product of meticulous obsessive work but then with the kind of burn pottery it's kind of unifying these two ideas where it's like you should work at things and you should really tr strive for um perfection or strive for what you want to see achieved but things aren't necessarily always going to uh, always pan out, you know, with a certain guarantee, even if you work at it. So I think there's kind of a couple of, like, ideas kind of intermingling here, which is always really lovely. It's a it's a certain paradox of, of our lives, I suppose, where we have to at once strive for perfection and come into peace with the idea that we will never get there. It's like... As much as we have our eyes to the stars, you know, we can never get there. But get a little bit closer, we can get just a little bit closer, then there's value in that. And mm -hmm. I think it's interesting, like, the last shot of this movie, you have Liz and Joe kind of walking down the street. You get the sense, like, there's, you know, they have, like, a good relationship and it seems like you know maybe they even have like a better relationship than they did before like you know maybe seeing the bird go free together you know did something to help bring them together and then we hear in the background a little pigeon a little pigeon coo the I, I i don't know if i can i don't think that's a pigeon it was flawless trying to get mobbed <laughs> my pigeon's just coming in and yeah, it just it's a very, very lovely movie. And makes you kind of pause and think about, you know, what you're doing with your life and where you want to go. Yeah. It's just a very, like, 
kind of chill. You know, it's it's pretty trite to, you know, that Kelly Reichardt and like quote unquote slow cinema are pretty much synonymous. Yeah. But I think she really <laughs> does know how to kind of take a bunch of ideas and just kind of let you like simmer in it for a while and you know there's no grand thesis statement per se but there's definitely an intent i think that's one of the things i like about just the idea that there's no specific place where someone says wow the real showing up was the pigeons we met along the way um you know there was you know like now as i was putting these things together i kind of had to think about i had to piece things together and I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that this is a movie that is still pretty approachable. Like, you know, just kind of like, you know, bringing everything together is able to, you know, pretty easily figure out like, oh, this is, this is the theme of the movie. But I appreciate that it was something that it let me come to a conclusion for myself. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I think that takes some confidence to kind of allow for that openness in storytelling. So, do you have any final closing thoughts about showing up? Um, I think it's, I really enjoy the film. It's something that I, you know, would definitely want to come back to, you know, time and again. I think it's, you know, among everything else we've talked about, I think it's just, a, I, I feel like the best sort of, we have films or, or whatnot that are sort of odes or pioneers to, you know, movies or art or, or anything like that. And I think the best ones like this are the ones that, have an authenticity to them they're not so gobsmacked by the process of creating art or the art itself that it becomes this sort of thing to put on a pedestal and gasp at you know this isn't a well you mentioned babylon or you know i don't know chima paradiso or something like that where it's venerating something rather than appreciating it you know this understands the difficulties and the, the hard side of of going through art it it can take the piss out of it with all the goofy you know uh art little kind of inserts of all the art students at the oregon college of art and craft which is also just peak uh portland you know <laughs> so it's, it's 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 able to kind of look at it and and you know smile and, and cry and do all of this and but ultimately you know when those we laugh at the people like dancing in the field and they don't even know what the class is but like at the end of the day they're making art and that's what they want to do and i think that's what makes this movie really shine making art it's like it's something that you know as much as we like to look at the end product and think about oh how magical it was to get there it's it's it, you know it's it's tricky you know like i've dabbled in a lot of different arts um you know i've tried like drawing i've tried doing a lot of different things and it's it, it is difficult, you know, um, and there's some things where I felt like, oh, like, this spoke to me enough that I wanted to keep pursuing it. There are other things where I was like, I don't think I have passion needed to kind of keep going through this. Um, I, I'll tell you what the, this movie very specifically evokes for me. When I was mm -hmm. little, um, growing up, Mesa, Arizona, our city had built like this big fancy new art center. Mm -hmm. But before they did that, we had our little rinky-dink city art center, like one story, um, and you know it's like concrete floors, no air conditioning, <laughs> <laughs> and this movie evoked memories of that for me. Just like being, mm -hmm. I think I must have been like six, seven years old. You know, and just like, you know, going to like art classes in the summer, but like, oh, today we're going to do drawing. Today we're going to do pottery. And just that, you know, discovering everything, you know. Um, And we, you know, like, you know, my, my clay pots, they were ugly. They didn't hold liquid. <laughs> they were <laughs> misshapen little things, but by golly, I was so proud of it. And my parents put it up on the shelf for us to look at. Yeah, yeah, and it, yeah. There's something that's very specific about the community in the movie that's also kind of somehow also just super universal, and you, there's a lot that people can relate to in it. Yeah, it's just 
Very lovely. Um, I think this is going to be one of the ones that is going to stick with me through the end of the year. Um, and yeah, so yeah. if you get a chance to see it, all of you li lovely listeners out there, if you get a chance to see it, do it. It's very nice, very lovely movie. Highly recommend. All right, and have any other thoughts you want to leave the lovely people on? Portland Timbers suck. <laughs> I am nonpartisan on this issue. So, <laughs> thank you everybody <laughs> so much for watching. Um, I've been Daniel Goldhorn. You can find my YouTube channel. You can find Raynerd at Slosh Cinema on Tumblr. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Good night.